Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Woodward, president of the Travelers Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you back to our program this afternoon. Before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's webinar. And also, I'd like to thank our partners for today's program, the Metro Hartford Alliance, the American Property and Casualty Insurance Association, the Risk and Uncertainty Management Center at the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business, and the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Welcome, all. We know that many of you joining us today think a lot about risk. Maybe you manage risk directly for your business, or you're working in the insurance industry helping others to manage their risk. Either way, I'm sure you'll agree, risk professionals from all sides of the business need to have a laser focus on the macroeconomic picture, everything from inflation, supply chain, interest rates, and the red hot job market. Today, we're really thrilled to welcome back to our show, Dr. Robert Hartwig, for an hour of impactful business insights, bringing together the most pressing trends in the insurance industry today, and helping us all to dig beyond the headlines and to really understand what's going on in the horizon in 2023. So Dr. Hartwig is the director of the Risk and Uncertainty Management Center at the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business. He also serves as the clinical associate professor of finance. He's also just joined the Federal Reserve Board's Insurance Policy Advisory Committee for a three-year term. And we're going to look forward to hearing about that new position later in our program. Dr. Hartwig's research focuses on insurance markets and structures, risk management, risk-bearing capital market instruments, and the financing of technology risks and venture capital in the insurance markets. That's a lot, folks. Uh, many of you may know his prior work as president and chief economist for the Insurance Information Institute, or the III, which is an organization that empowers consumers by providing insights and information about insurance. He's a hugely sought after speaker uh, in the insurance industry and has testified before a number of congressional as well as state legislative committees. So we're really lucky to have him with us today. Um, we're gonna open with uh, Bob's signature, uh, 85 slides, no, I'm just kidding, but about a 30 minute presentation first from Bob. And then we're gonna come back together for a discussion and questions. I know you're gonna have plenty of questions for Bob, I do. Uh, and I promise to get to as many as I can. So drop those in the Q&A. And uh, Bob, we're just thrilled to have you with us today. And as always, uh, really looking forward to hearing your insights. Well, thank you very much, Joan. And my pleasure to be here once again on Wednesdays with Woodward and uh, your, your second uh, webinar of the 2023, 2023 season. And you know, 2022 was an extraordinary year. 2023 is going to be another extraordinary year. We're only two weeks into it, and I can already tell. And that's kind of the subject of today's presentation. I mean, there are a lot of headlines out there that can often be confusing, contradictory to one another. And so I'm going to kind of give you a quick lay of the land of what's going on uh, with the economy, with financial markets, and so forth, uh, and what that all means uh, for the property casualty insurance industry. So uh, let's just kind of plow ahead and... Um, talk about uh, where the economy uh, is today and, and where it's likely headed. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion over the past year, a year and a half, about inflation. How much of a threat is that in the year ahead? And speaking of threats, uh, the question of recession, is a recession looming? Uh, is it a, a recession inevitable or will the Fed successfully engineer a soft landing? And then we'll drill back uh, and take a look at what all this means for the property casualty insurance industry in terms of growth, underwriting performance, investment performance, and those other things that are very, very important uh, to each and every insurer in this industry. And we'll talk about a couple of special issues that are, are really problematic right now, uh, including uh, legal system abuse and, uh, and social inflation issues. Uh, and then we should have the time again, as you mentioned, for some Q&A at the end. So let's just quickly uh, uh, get right into it in terms of the economy. Where is that? Uh, well, you know, the most recent data suggests that we finished 2022 on a relatively strong note, even though we wound up in the first half of the year uh, with two quarters in a row of negative economic growth. Many people thought that that meant we were in a recession. We were not. The uh, job market is just too strong to really suggest that at any point in 2022, we were at a recession. And we are absolutely positively not in a recession right now. Uh, the question really is whether or not we will be one later this year. By later this year, I mean in the second half of this year. And so 
Uh, the current forecast suggests we'll have a relatively shallow recession beginning sometime in the second half of 2023, perhaps spilling into early 2024. The good news is actually that uh, that the, the decline in the economy, the shrinkage in the economy forecast for the second half of this year has actually been uh, taken down a little bit. And, and that's because of uh, some positive news on, the, on a global scale, such as the reopening of China. Uh, things aren't quite as bad in Europe as we anticipated, and all that has positive spillover effects to the United States. Um, and in fact, uh, what's going on in the world today is a global phenomenon. Now, we've had a global slowdown over the past year or so, uh, and that has been led by a slowdown in advanced economies, particularly the United States, but also places like the UK and, and, and certain countries in the Eurozone. Of course, uh, last year was a very difficult year with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, driving up energy prices and inflation. So that's been a challenge. Now, uh, as it turns out, uh, many European countries have done better than expected. And again, uh, somewhat enhanced outlook for Europe. And with China reopening, uh, we would expect a little boost from, from that as well. So the global picture, not quite reflected in these statistics here, is a little bit better for 2023 than we would have anticipated a little while ago. Um, the unemployment situation has actually been a very good one. When we think about exposure and workers' compensation, uh, the unemployment rate in December of 2022 was 3.5%. That was tied to the lowest since 1969. Uh, you can't argue with that. Now, the question is, is where is it headed from here? Uh, the consensus is sort of that we will wind up with an unemployment rate that is above 4% and close to 5% by the end of 2023, and perhaps exceeding 5% by uh, the first half of 2024. We'll see. I would expect this potentially to be dialed back a bit as well. And um, the good news is that uh, there is a possibility that we could avoid recession altogether. And I'll talk about what the probability of that is in a moment. Now, we look at major sectors of the economy that are important to insurers. We can look at you know new auto uh, and light truck sales out there. Uh, those look like bad numbers in 2022. Or, uh, but that's a result of supply chain issues, which are largely becoming uh, unkinked. So expect more auto sales as a result of some um, uh, solutions uh, coming to the supply chains. Um, and that's good news. And with ultimately reaching what we would expect, kind of a pre-COVID level of auto sales by 2024. Very important for personal auto line, which accounts for 38% of all written premiums in the property casualty insurance industry. And differentiate this from the financial crisis, where you can see that auto sales fell off a cliff. That was due to weakness in household finances and a collapse in the overall economy. This time, again, it's a supply chain issue, something we can overcome. On the housing side, uh, you can see, uh, you do see some of a sharp decline in terms of a new home construction. By sharp, I mean about 17%. Uh, now, that's nothing compared to the 70% or so we saw during the financial crisis. That is essentially being engineered by the Fed in higher interest rates. Uh, to the extent that the Fed perhaps uh, can start to dial back rates a little sooner than we might be anticipating, perhaps uh, late 2023 rather than 2024, we could see a little boost there uh, because there is a lot of unsatisfied demand for housing in the United States today, whereas demand simply evaporated uh, back in the financial crisis. Uh, moving on from there, the question about recession, and that's the R word, and you know this is the $100 trillion question for uh, 2023 is, will we have a recession? You can't get away from that question. Um, and, and the most recent survey of, of a, a Wall Street economist by the Wall Street Journal, which just came out the other day, uh, about 61%, actually 61% of economists who were surveyed in January, and I, and I think actually there's been actually one data update since the number I'm showing you here. So the number in January of 61%. Uh, and that's down slightly from 63%. So what does this mean? It means roughly 60% of economists think that within the next 12 months, we will have a recession and about 40% think we will not. Uh, so uh, there, is, there is a reasonably strong likelihood that we could avert recession, uh, but perhaps the most likely scenario again is a relatively shallow recession. Now this is important for the industry because this is an industry that is very much joined at the hip. Uh, with respect to the overall economy. So here you see in blue, uh, direct written premium growth for the property casualty business, and you see year over year uh, nominal, in other words, not inflation adjusted GDP growth, in other words, pace of growth of the overall economy. You can see those are pretty tightly correlated with one another. 
So to the extent we see a deceleration in the economy in 2023, we would expect to see a deceleration in premium growth in 2023 as well, and perhaps carrying a bit into 2024. So we're not talking about a plunge like we saw during the financial crisis. Uh, we are talking about a moderation uh, in growth uh, beginning really in the second half of this year. Now, the inflation threat is still with us. It's real. It was a big problem in 2022. It was the number one concern of businesses, of consumers, and obviously, therefore, it has implications for insurers. We wound up 2022, and that's no longer an estimate. The 8% is an official number. Uh, that's what it actually came out to. And uh, what we see is an expectation that uh, we'll see a fairly sharp decline in 2023. And uh, again, I had to send in these, uh, this presentation about a week or so ago. Since then, we've had an update. So the expectation would be in 2023, the inflation rate would actually be only about 3.4% and about 2.4% in 2024. So the updates that we've been receiving based on the most recent information and trends uh, on inflation, and which came out late last week, uh, suggests that uh, in, in inflation is taking a bit of a softer turn. In other words, the inflationary trends are moderating a bit more quickly than we had originally anticipated. And that's unambiguously a good thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, these are the November uh, numbers showing the individual components of the consumer price index. The uh, December numbers came out were, were similar in that they showed the gray part of the bar, meaning energy, pulling down the overall pace of inflation. Whereas before, you can see the gray bar was on top. It was dramatically pulling up the pace of inflation. Also pulling down inflation is such things as vehicle prices, very, very important to, uh, to auto insurers, to commercial auto insurers, of course. Uh, but what's keeping inflation sort of elevated is the cost of housing, shelter. Uh, that's a big issue right now, uh, although even there, there are signs of some moderation, which is good news. But no question that uh, there have been big impacts uh, in terms of the surge in inflation for insurers. Claim severities across property lines, auto lines, both personal and commercial uh, have been increasing. Medical inflation with some lag has actually been coming up uh, or accelerating, although it's beginning to decelerate a little bit right now, which is actually good news in the most recent data. Um, and of course, this means that uh, you know, insurers have their work cut out for them in the sense that they have to embed these new trends in their rates, and that takes some period of time. And um, if this inflation, if inflation were to persist, you, know, you could ask questions uh, whether or not there would be issues with respect to rate adequacy and reserve adequacy, uh, those were big issues back in the 70s and 80s when we had uh, inflation that was much higher than we see today. And insurance to value is a concern as well with uh, inflation rising at a fairly rapid clip. Uh, many risks may actually find out that they're insufficiently covered in the event that they have a total loss. Now again, inflation, just like slow GDP growth is a global phenomenon, 8% here in the US, uh, but you can see in the UK, uh, and in the EU, for instance, it's been uh, worse than here. Of course, that's largely due to the more substantial impact that they've taken um, associated with higher energy prices. Uh, the good news, uh, other good news is that consumer expectations for inflation uh, are not uh, spiraling upward. In fact, they're moving downward. So whether we're looking one year ahead or three years ahead or five years ahead, Universally, consumers are expecting the pace of inflation to moderate. And it's very important for the Federal Reserve uh, to, uh, to see this because it, it, makes, it, it helps the Fed understand that consumers are not anchoring their inflationary expectations on some ever rising number. That's exactly what happened in the 70s. And you wind up with these kind of uh, wage and price spirals uh, that are very difficult to break. So the latest evidence suggests that we are not in a wage price spiral and that the Federal Reserve ultimately will likely be successful uh, in terms of getting inflation under control without driving the economy into one or more very deep recessions. That's what happened in the 1980s. Um, uh, other bit of good news is that we've heard a lot about wage inflation recently. Uh, however, uh, that is even slowing. In the December numbers, we saw it uh, slow uh, to 4.6% from the full year 2022 number, which is 5.2%. Uh, and in the fourth quarter of 2022, it was 4.1%. Uh, <clears throat> so again, no evidence here of a wage price spiral. Wages are beginning to moderate. Uh, and we're, I expect that we're going to begin to see a, a rebalancing of the kind of relationship that we've seen over the past couple of years between employers and employees. 
uh, where they're going to work, and uh, and a variety of other things. It's been very much picked in favor of employees over the past uh, two and a half years or so. And that's likely to shift back somewhat. Um, uh, we also had an update in terms of these figures shown here. In the December figures, we had the CPI was up six and a half percent, and wage inflation was up about four point one um, uh, percent. So. Uh, we are seeing both move in the right direction, but we're also seeing the gap between wages and inflation uh, uh, narrow. And what that means is that hopefully sometime in 2023, workers will once again enjoy real wage gains rather than seeing the, uh, the, the real value of their wages actually fall because of inflation. Now, one very stubborn issue we have is the fact that a lot of people have decided apparently they aren't going to work again. Uh, and uh, you can see this through the labor force particip participation rate is much lower than it was uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, and it's really difficult to know what is going to get this back. Um, and uh, many people have decided that they are simply dropping out of the labor force and, and aren't coming back in. And um, that, that can be the acceleration of baby boomers uh, moving into uh, the retired category. Uh, other people, even younger than that, have decided that uh, they're simply not going to work um, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. So uh, so that's uh, helping keep the labor markets uh, a, a bit tighter than they otherwise would be. Um, <clears throat> here you can also see that um, you can see the uh, consumer price index in red and the pace of medical inflation in blue. Uh, and uh, updates for December, which have come in since I submitted this presentation, show both of these declining. Uh, and that's good news. And so uh, while I was a bit concerned that medical inflation with a lag was actually going to take off like a rocket, like uh, some other service sectors, in fact, that doesn't seem to be the case. So that's excellent news for workers' comp and lost time medical claim severities, for instance, which are in the $25,000 range frequently. Uh, and uh, when you think about bodily injury claims and, and, and personal and uh, commercial auto, these sorts of things. So this trend is headed in the right direction, um, and I'm encouraged by that going into 2023. Now, are things as bad as many people believe them to be? We have heard uh, kind of never-ending stories last year uh, about how bad the economy is. It's never been worse. Um, and you know, I can test that hypothesis by taking a look at uh, two things that people really focus on. Um, people don't like being unemployed. We can take that as a given, and they don't like paying higher prices. Uh, and so if we take those two and, and, and measure the, uh, take a look at the inflation rate and the unemployment rate on the same chart going all the way back to 1948, uh, what we can see is, um, I, I've uh, highlighted some of the peaks here to show you uh, that things you can kind of tell were kind of a lot worse in the early 1980s, maybe late 1970s. Uh, and if I add the unemployment rate to the inflation rate, we get what economists call the misery index. Uh, and the misery index last year was 11.6. Uh, that's a bit below what it was during the financial crisis, but it's far below what it was, say, in 1980 or back in 1975. And in reality, the decade from 1974 uh, to 1983, in terms of misery, meaning the double whammy of inflation and unemployment, is far worse than it is today. You look at 1980. Unemployment was double what it is today, and the inflation rate was not 8%, it was 13.5%. And by the way, if you wanted a mortgage in 1980, you were going to pay through the nose, you were going to pay 18% for that versus maybe just under 7% in, uh, in late 2022. So a big, big difference there. Now, uh, and we expect that misery index to actually improve over the next two years. Looking at the PNC insurance industry directly, and specifically, well, I had uh, prior to Hurricane Ian in late September, I was hopeful for a year with a combined ratio around 100. Uh, but with Ian and a few other late in the year events, probably looking around 104, 105 combined. So probably the worst year since 2017, but bad for the same reason. Very, very high cat losses. That sounds, that's pretty much the norm. We don't have final 2022 numbers yet. So this is the net income or profits after tax the industry through the first six months of the year. Uh, so uh, you, you might say, well, I'll double that number and it looks like a really good year, but the majority of the cat losses were in the second part of the year, uh, continued financial market losses. So that's gonna really eat in uh, to net income. So I expect net income to fall uh, back uh, considerably from the last four years. Uh, it's a little hard to say at this point because I don't have much information on what kind of realized losses there were 
on the industry's investment portfolio, but no doubt they were consequential uh, given we had a 19% decline in the equities market and the worst year in the bond markets for quite a few years. Um, now, uh, but on the sort of positive side, at least for commercial insurers, we can see uh, that the hard market or at least the modest hard market uh, continues um, with renewals in the high single digits according to uh, recent uh, broker surveys. And what's leading the way is perhaps not a surprise here when you look by line, cyber. Cyber's on a big line, maybe four or five billion dollars, but uh, there's no shortage of, of, of major events that we've seen in terms of uh, attacks and hacks and ransomware on major corporations and, and many that you never hear about, small and medium-sized corporations, governments, and so on. So that's driving up the cost of cyber coverage. Uh, commercial umbrella really being impacted by abuse of the loss of the, the legal system in the United States and commercial property making its way up, of course, because of the record or near record high cat losses. The only line showing a consistent decline is workers' comp, which still continues to show best combined ratios that we've seen um, in going back at least as far as we can go with workers' comp, which is somewhere into the 1940s or 1930s. So really strong results there. Um, but uh, when we look at investment income, again, it looked like a pretty good uh, year through the first half of 2022, and it probably will be a pretty good year for investment income. And so one silver lining of higher interest rates uh, for large institutional investors like insurers is our investment income will rise. Uh, and the investment yield on the portfolio is already up for the first half of 2022. Uh, that's great news. So a little bit of a tailwind for insurers here to help offset some of the poor underwriting results uh, and some of the poor results in terms of uh, the fact that some uh, losses will have to be realized on the investment portfolio. Uh, the, the hikes in interest rates are not over. The Federal Reserve is, uh, seems destined to continue uh, or determined to continue its uh, rate hikes probably uh, into the uh, early part of the summer, uh, perhaps the last hike occurring around June if all goes well, and then holding steady for a while, and then maybe beginning to bring rates down at the very end of 2023, maybe the Fed's last meeting of the year in December. It could be early 2024. Uh, but right now, I might put a little bet on, uh, on, on the December meeting. So that uh, would help us uh, help stimulate the economy, get us back on a solid growth trajectory, and help stave off that potential for even a shallow recession. Uh, but as uh, you can see in this chart, the interest rates have shot up recently. 10-year uh, treasuries in blue and the two-year treasury in orange. You can see the two-year yields ahead of the 10-year yield. Uh, and what that suggests, some people believe that means is suggestive of a recession, but another way to look at it is it means investors who are looking out over 10 years are not expecting inflation to persist. And that's how exactly I read this. Um, bond markets in particular are, are not buying into the narrative uh, that inflation uh, is here to stay. Okay? Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we did have a uh, uh, last year a, a pretty substantial decline, certainly had a uh, Bear market, uh, we were down about 19.5%. Uh, although, um, as of the end of last week, we we're actually up about 4.5%. But it looks like this week we're giving some of that back. But the year is still young. There's going to be a lot of volatility in Wall Street, and that's something you can take for a given. But the industry is very, very well prepared for that kind of volatility. There was far more volatility right around the beginning of COVID during the financial crisis. So I think the industry is very well positioned to manage uh, any volatility that we see in 2023. Now, of course, uh, it is the case that the declining value of, of, of obviously the stock market equities and rising interest rates, which led to lower prices for bonds, has caused an overall uh, reduction or deflation in the price of assets held in the industries investment portfolio. And so that is what is responsible for about an 8% decline in the industry's policyholder surplus, its capacity through the first half of 2022, down from a record of 1.1 trillion at the end of 2021. And this has further to go. So when we get the final 2022 results, uh, we're probably going to be down a total of uh, more than 10%, probably I'd say 10 to 14%. Um, and which isn't too far away, at least at the higher end of that estimate, of what we saw in the financial crisis, which is when we saw, uh, we saw uh, capacity fall by about 16%. It fell about 9% in the early days of COVID, but uh, we came back quickly and set new records very shortly after that. But again, 
the industry is prepared for this, but it does it does speak to the fact that there's a bit less capital uh, uh, in, in the industry and uh, not here, not just here in the United States, but globally. So this is something that is impacting, for instance, reinsurance market. Uh, the vast majority of reinsurance capital comes from abroad. Uh, reinsurers have a tough time of it recently with very high cat losses uh, around the world, not just here in the US, pushing up reinsurance prices. Uh, what's happened in the investment side is decreased uh, capacity and talking about um, uh, the, the cat situation through the third quarter about, of last year, about 70 billion in insured cat losses. There's still not a final number for, for Hurricane Ian at this point. So uh, we can't quite say with certainty where we wound up, but altogether we're probably somewhere between 75 and $80 billion uh, in, um, in total insured cat losses for 2022. Um, uh, and what you can see is these, uh, the, the insured losses step up by about $5 billion a year every decade. Um, and there's nothing about that that's going to change. The demographics of the country are such that more and more people, more and more businesses are moving into areas that are more and more prone uh, to a wide variety of natural disasters, whether it's in the Southeast, uh, whether it's wildfires out in the West or the mountain states, you name it. Um, and so in terms of the top 22 insured cat losses of all time, uh, Ian could surpass Katrina. I'm very interested to see when we get a final number for that. Um, right now, I have it surpassing it by a decent margin, but there are actually some estimates out there that put it um, somewhat below. So we'll have to see it. It might be a couple more months before we actually get a final number on that one. On the private passenger auto side, this is very interesting because I thought you might like to see what happens, what's happened to frequency and severity during COVID and afterwards. You can see that during COVID, this is for the four quarters ending the first quarter of 2001. So this is the worst uh, effects of COVID. And you can see frequency dropping across all the major coverages, although severity continued to increase. Now looking at the broader the picture over the longer period of time, something like bodily injury frequency and severity. In gold, you can see that the, the frequency fell off a cliff during COVID, a bit in 2021 as well. But severity continued to rise, in fact, to record levels in terms of increase and continues in 2022. And the same for something like collision claim severity, which reached a record high early in 2021 and isn't far off of that. Um, in fact, we have a third quarter number for 2022. It's not different, uh, too much different from the second quarter. So uh, we're a bit off the highs, but severities are very much elevated. The last topic uh, before we open it up for uh, questions is legal system abuse, sometimes referred to as uh, social inflation. This rising litigation costs that we are seeing are very problematic. And uh, it's not something that the industry can manage on its own. It's a problem that we see. Uh, it's entrenched uh, in, for instance, many state legislatures where we have uh, very, very powerful trial bars, uh, essentially making rules for their own benefit. Um, you have uh, very, very, you have increased propensity to sue. Uh, uh, jury wards, uh, the size of jury wards is uh, rising. Courts uh, more favorable to plaintiffs, a distrust of larger corporations, litigation financing, uh, and many other things. And again, a very, very aggressive uh, plaintiff's bar that's out there uh, today. So getting the necessary regulatory changes uh, to getting the cooperation among many different industry groups is going to be a huge challenge uh, for this industry that's going to stretch far beyond 2023. And so you can see this multi-year trend of at rising average jury awards. But you know that aside, uh, that's a big long-term issue for the industry. The good news is the industry does remain strong, stable, sound, and secure. Uh, in 2022, as we enter 2023, and just as it was in 2020, uh, or in the financial crisis. The shallow recession seems likely later in the year, though it's not a done deal. Asset price volatility, absolutely going to continue, but higher interest rates are providing a modest tailwind for the industry. Uh, inflationary pressures are beginning to subside, though they do persist to some extent, uh, and are going to be more pronounced on the service side versus the goods side, which is a reverse of what we've seen the last couple of years. Um, yes, we do have some lingering supply chain issues, uh, but those are diminishing in number and intensity. So that's, uh, that's good news as well. And so immediate concern for insurers is the omnipresent threat, uh, uh, threat of escalating cats. 
the lingering effects of inflation and making sure the industry is able to achieve rate and reserve adequacy, making sure our clients are properly insured to value ITV. Okay, so uh, Joan, uh, that just about ends the, uh, the presentation. So I think I'll hand it back uh, uh, to you and uh, hopefully people can see us on the screen. And then I guess we can move to the Q&A portion here. Well, Bob, that was just fantastic. I mean, a whirlwind of information and uh, we got lots of questions in the Q&A coming at yours. So Bob, you mentioned you just went through everything I think that's on our listeners' minds right now. And it's just great to hear you in kind of the beginning of the year because your outlook uh, usually holds. And so talking about a recession, uh, we may be able to even avoid that was actually uh, really good to hear. And also uh, you saying it would be possibly short and shallow and the Fed uh, looks like is uh, they're, uh, they're doing the right thing for now. Uh, it looks like inflation is starting to come under control. So I really appreciate those comments. Um, what we like to do on our program is we like to turn the tables on our audience and we like to ask an audience question to get a sense of how they're thinking. So let's pull up that question. Uh, for the audience, in your opinion, the greatest challenge facing the PNC industry in 2023 is, is what? And we asked this question back in 2021, same question, Bob, when we had you on last time uh, to accolades, as we always hear after your, after your uh, sessions. And so we're going to look at some of those numbers, too, that we saw in 2021. So what are you most concerned about? And of course, uh, cats are on everyone's mind, the economy we just talked about. Um, let's see. So looks like about half of the audience is worried about cats and volatile weather. And you see this all over the place, uh, certainly in California in the last few days. We only have about 18% of us worried about the economy. So that actually is good. Maybe you have uh, assuaged them that uh, might not be so bad. Uh, litigation climate is certainly, uh, it looks like to be number two right now. Talent and acquisition. We want to talk about this with you, Bob, because I know you're educating all those young, bright insurance students in your program, and we certainly want access to them. And I know a lot of folks on the line want to hear about how we get in touch with you, too, on getting your talent into our agencies and carriers. So do you want to comment on this, Bob? The uh, only thing I'll say, I think back in 2021, only 6% of the, uh, the group was worried about the economy. So this actually is pretty encouraging, I think, in terms of people worried about the economy for the business, because it's consumer confidence, right? If you're not, you're not terribly concerned about the economy, you're confident things will get better, and that is a, a spiral upward, right? Right. So I, I think that actually the, the mood of your typical consumer and your typical small and medium sized business person will probably improve a bit um, as we move during uh, to the first part of the year. It doesn't mean that there aren't challenges out there, but uh, the number one concern by far of businesses and consumers in 2022 was inflation. So to the extent that that subsides, uh, it's, it's hard to overstate uh, the psychological effect that very high frequency pieces of information, in other words, driving past your favorite gas station two or three times a day, or every time you go to the grocery store and you think the price of something went up, um, that really infiltrates people's psyche. Uh, it can also work in reverse. Now, now uh, obviously, we don't want a situation in which, um, which uh, unemployment begins to overtake uh, concerns about inflation. Uh, and um, that is a, a consideration for the second half of the year. But, uh, but all in all, uh, the, the economic situation right now is, 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 is not bad in the sense that what we are doing is we have, again, the lowest unemployment rate essentially that we've had since the late 1960s. Uh, we have economic growth that is certainly going to slow. Um, but the picture is, is by no means anywhere analogous to what we saw during the financial crisis. And so you can think about this year as sort of a rebalancing year, the year when we finally uh, move away from that kind of pandemic related economy and by 2024, hopefully getting back on a more normalized track for the US and for the global economy. Great, excellent. <clears throat> so Bob, I wanna ask you about uh, your recent election to the Federal Reserve Board Insurance Policy Advisory Committee. Tell us about, first of all, what is that? Uh, what do they do? They're advising the Fed, I guess, on insurance-related uh, issues. But um, are, do, you, do you have impact in terms of monetary policy, or you're just helping them understand? And when was this uh, body created? 
Is this the right. news? So, well, I would like to say I have inputs in terms of monetary policy, but Jay Powell has yet to call me. Um, so, uh, no, the uh, the Insurance Policy Advisory Committee uh, doesn't have any role in monetary policy. It exists for a specific purpose. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it, it comes out of a piece of legislation, uh, I think that was approved by Congress of, uh, about 10 or 11 years ago. And it's a recognition that the insurance industry is an employer, an important player in the overall financial services industry in the United States. So historically, we think about the Fed only paying attention to banks, for instance. And that's where most of its attention is. Uh, but it, it's it's become increasingly clear to the Fed that the insurance industry is a very, very important uh, component of the overall financial services industry. And, uh, and, and, and it's essential in order to help maintain uh, the stability of, of, for, for growth in the United States. Uh, really, nothing gets done unless you have insurance sitting behind it. For instance, you can't build buildings, you can't hire workers, you can't lay a railroad, you can't uh, build infrastructure, all of these things require a strong, stable, sound insurance industry uh, kind of sitting behind the financial markets that finance markets in. And so, but the, the role of the uh, IPAC, uh, the Insurance Policy Advisory Committee, is to provide input to the Fed and to the staff uh, in terms of helping them understand um, some of the important issues going on in the industry. So for instance, capital standards, both, uh, international capital standards, so much of capital in the United States insurance markets comes from abroad, uh, both uh, through primary markets and especially through uh, reinsurance. The securitization of risk is an overlap uh, between uh, finance and, and insurance. That's increasingly important um, uh, dimension. Um, uh, there are some other issues, of course, I think, uh, although we're just developing our agenda and it's my first time on, on this committee, um, uh, issues potentially related uh, to climate are important uh, as, as well. And, uh, and, and we'll have to see. So the uh, the, so the committee's uh, reports are, are, um, are public information, uh, and uh, from what I can see, they get posted to the IPAX uh, uh, part of the website uh, on, on the Federal Reserve's website. So I encourage everybody to check those out over time. But I'm very uh, much looking forward to working with colleagues in the property casualty insurance industry, the reinsurance industry, and the life insurance industry, no health insurance. Okay, and those are all in the, at the Federal Reserve Advisory Committee. That's really interesting. Do you think maybe it was set up 10 years ago because... There was time. There was a time where people were talking about had federal regulation of insurance and getting away from the fifty state uh, bodies. But this might be a way for them to get federal input, right? In terms well, of what the market is so doing. In, in the wake of the financial crack crisis, and uh, we had the Dodd Frank Act and so on, we had a number of insurers that were named uh, systemically important financial institutions, so-called CIFIs. And certainly that raised the profile of the insurance industry with the Federal Reserve. Uh, and, um, and so since that time, I think the Fed has recognized that it's important to pay attention to the industry. The industry will, will state unequivocally that they don't believe that they rise to the level of uh, needing an additional level, uh, an additional layer of regulation. Uh, but nevertheless, making sure that the Fed is, is adequately informed about the industry is still important, even if uh, the Fed is not uh, you know, engaged in day-to-day -day regulation of the industry. Uh, it is, that still remains the purview of, of the state. Great. Well, we wish you luck in the new role, and uh, they're lucky to have you, obviously, with all of your insights in the, in the, in the real world. Um, I want to shift a little bit because we just had an election. We have a new Congress that was just installed. Obviously, the Republicans are now in, in firm control of the, of the House and the Democrats and the Senate still. Um, do you think there's going to be any meaningful impacts to the PNC industry from any legislation coming out of this new Congress? And if so, what, what would those impacts be? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I, you know, with a narrowly divided Congress, um, what you what you expect is gridlock, okay, in, in general. And some people believe that that is a good thing, uh, that you that not too much will change. Um, there are a few things uh, that are out there. For instance, uh, it is been the case that the feds do seem interested in trying to uh, get information from the industry related to, say, climate-related disclosures, um, uh, potentially on issues related uh, to 
uh, race uh, that could affect the various arguments related to disparate impact and, and these kinds of things. How much traction these uh, these things will get is 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 unclear and is very narrowly uh, divided Congress that we have. I, I'm not expecting a, a, a lot of uh, land of uh, landmark legislation um, that is going to have direct bearing on the on the property casualty insurance industry. You know, Congress has some work cut out for it in the sense that, uh, for instance, we have a looming debt ceiling. Um, that's in front of us. We're already beginning to hear about that. So the worst thing that Congress could possibly do uh, to upset large institutional investors like the insurance industry would be to uh, to kind of you know wait until uh, the, the midnight hour is upon us uh, before, for instance, addressing issues related to the debt ceiling. We don't need that kind of turmoil and turbulence um, in, in in the marketplace. Um, I think a lot of the action is probably at the state level uh, nowadays, where we have uh, you know, numerous states uh, attempting, as they always do, to try to narrow or reduce or entirely eliminate certain categories of underwriting criteria that are used, for instance, in, in auto insurance. Um, this is a never-ending uh, battle for the insurance industry, who uh, is simply trying to uh, adopt and implement and use rating models that, uh, uh, that are accurate and, 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 and provide for competitive market, uh, uh, markets. So, Insurers would like to be able to use models that uh, uh, formally uh, incorporate impacts of, of climate change looking forward, but in general, they're not allowed to do that at the state level, even in states that claim to be very proactive on the, on the climate related issue and states that are you know, uh, literally on a daily basis on television or with, with floods or uh, wildfires or, or what have you. Um, so I, I think that, um, uh, you know, looking ahead also, there's, there's a lot of work to do. And I, I hinted at this in the presentation. I mean, ideally, would we love to have some kind of national tort reform? Uh, but I don't hear that being discussed uh, in, in um, and, and so it's a, uh, perhaps there's some federal dimensions to this, but uh, historically, there's been a large kind of grassroots state by state, uh, you know, operation that has to occur with a triaging about what some of these issues are, um, such as you know, uh, litigation financing. When, when a jury hears that someone else is funding the lawsuit against the defendant, uh, they begin to think that that's not maybe, a, that's not a good idea. So perhaps some sort of mandatory disclosure or something like that. So um, I hope we can take a few incremental steps here, but uh, the prescription generally in a divided Congress is for the Okay, we answered a number of questions that came in uh, from the audience, especially around the debt ceiling and, and raising it um, with regard to, to this Congress. So let's hope uh, that they do it expeditiously and, and it won't be uh, holding everyone, um, at, as you say, the midnight hour up, uh, up at night. I wanna switch a little bit to talent acquisition because we get a lot of questions from our audience members about this. And we had a number of uh, webinars around Gen Z and how to work with our incoming young folks to our offices. So with an extremely light, tight labor market, you're working with students every day, Bob, uh, and all the hiring managers dialing in today, uh, they really wanna know what Gen Z is looking for in an employer, what's important to them as they decide to take a job or not take a job, what are you hearing or seeing from your students? Well, uh, you know, first of all, just to, uh, I, I will say that uh, we've had uh, great success um, placing our students. The job market's quite good. In fact, uh, uh, my top student last year and our student of the year and my research assistant went to Travelers, Jones, by the way. So, uh, uh, so a shout out to Elizabeth out in, uh, out in Pittsburgh uh, with, with Travelers right now. Uh, you, you were absolutely wonderful. Um, but the, uh, the, you know, this, the Gen Z. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. So I, I do a lot of not just teaching classes, I do a lot of mentoring and career coaching and these sorts of things uh, for students. And I very much enjoy that. Um, and uh, for, for top students out there, the students that are very motivated. And by the way, uh, if you think that Gen Z and millennials are a bunch of lazy types, I mean, that's kind of an overgeneralization. Uh, the, I'm, I'm a baby boomer and I can tell you there were lazy baby boomers too. Um, but the reality is a lot of really hardworking, motivated individuals out there. Um, but uh, what I do notice in the post-pandemic environment is that I, I get some questions when it comes to evaluating job offers that have never gotten before. 
Okay. Um, historically, it's been related to things like, well, what do you think about this offer in terms of salary and benefits? And what do you think about this location and, and opportunities for upward mobility in the organization? Um, I, I do get more questions now about what do you think about company A versus company B in terms of the work-life balance, okay? So you think that might be something that uh, the parents of these individuals, of these students might be thinking about, but this is percolated down right to, to the new college graduate level where they're hearing this all the time too about work-life balance. And so that gets into a, a wide variety of issues of, for instance, are you gonna be in a remote environment? Are you gonna be in a hybrid environment? Um, we hear increasingly about companies saying they're going to bring more people back into the office and require them. A lot of big companies like tech companies, Disney, uh, uh, financial companies, banks are requiring people to spend more time in the office because they believe there has been a fundamental loss of, 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 of creativity and spontaneity and these sorts of things. And to be honest with you, I agree uh, to a very real extent with, with, with that. Uh, people like Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, is a much smarter guy than I am when it comes to running the company. Uh, and who knows about those things. Um, and so uh, I, I do think that to some extent, uh, you know, the Gen Z, those who are graduating college right now, their view of the labor market is formed by what they've observed over the past two years, where the labor market has been very tight, where workers have had the upper hand. There's two empty jobs for every one job seeker that's out there. You can hop jobs with a big increase um, very quickly. And guess what? You might even be able to work remotely or work remotely part-time. Um, there's going to be a rebalancing, I think, in the year ahead. So that's something I have to try to make sure I can manage their, their expectations. But yeah, it, it's absolutely true that um, <clears throat> while there are uh, many very, very hardworking, well-qualified individuals, they are taking into consideration more of this work-life balance than they, they did um, in the past. And uh, again, they're digesting that from social media. They're digesting that uh, from, from parents, uh, from uh, friends and family members who graduated from college a, a couple of years earlier. And so it'd be interesting to see where we go. What, what do you, what is a, what is a piece of advice or maybe one piece of advice that you can help some of the companies listening in today to try to hire some of these new students in 2023? Do you have a website that you uh, prefer or is there someplace uh, the insurance industry does a good job of kind of posting all of their available? Well, yeah, the, the, the piece of advice that I, I would give is, um, you know, great companies like Travelers do this, that um, the, the most effective way to ensure that you're gonna get the best talent in the door uh, is to maintain a continuous relationship uh, with the schools, colleges, and universities where you are recruiting. Uh, just don't show up at the job fair one day, uh, set up your tent, uh, set up your desk, and then, and then the kiosk and then leave. Um, uh, companies that in particular, I would, uh, and if I had to zero down to one particular um, determinant of landing the top talent is going to be internships. Okay, uh, that, that, was, that was the case with Elizabeth, okay? Uh, she interned twice with Travelers. Um, and I find that top students who in, have a good internship experience are overwhelmingly likely to go with that company upon graduation. And uh, so you're able to make that individual an offer literally in the first weeks of their senior year. Uh, and that's uh, something that, and then that's helping nail down your, your talent needs for the year ahead. Uh, students certainly like nailing that down ahead of time. And in this way, they're less likely to be, you know, pilfered uh, by some other company because the market is um, still pretty active, still pretty tight right now. And we filled up the entire, just the business school, we filled up the entire county convention center uh, and had a waiting list for companies uh, looking to recruit students um, this past fall. And we're doing the same thing uh, in February of this year. So we're excited about that. Uh, but the competition is uh, remain strong. And also, uh, if you can, uh, you know, people like me will help you work with or identify individual students where there might be a really good match for you. And again, that can that can happen at the, at the internship phase, uh, but also in terms of the full time. position. Great. Terrific. Thank you for that advice. We're going to shift again. And we're going to talk about cyber insurance because it's such an important 
uh, thing for our business community today. And the market is just constantly evolving, as you know. Where do you see the future of cyber uh, insurance for businesses? Where do you see this heading, Bob? We've, as you talked about, the ransomware hacks were up dramatically during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the cyber product? So I'm, um, there are two views, I'd say, in the industry about cyber right now. Uh, one is that it's a uh, you know, four, four or five billion dollar line in its infancy, uh, and we need to learn a lot more about how to underwrite better uh, and price better in this line. But um, you know the, the general trend is upward and onward in terms of, of growth uh, for this line. Uh, it, the other view is that cyber is ultimately likely to become an uninsurable risk. So these are kind of polar extremes. Uh, that some some believe that for a variety of reasons, for instance, the magnitude of cyber events will be such that uh, we we cannot possibly um, uh, accept this risk on our books. That the aggregation risk, when you think about a major cyber attack impacting uh, you know much of the United States, many industries, or if not around the world, you think about the way those losses could aggregate up to insurers and to reinsurers. They could be um, you know catastrophically. Uh, large, um, exceeding even the largest natural disasters that we've ever seen in time, if this market continues to grow uh, the way that we've seen it uh, grow, and we don't do a better job of underwriting and pricing it. Um, that's kind of a very pessimistic point of view. Uh, the I could easily see if you went back 100 years or so and you said, you know, uh, we're just starting to underwrite these airplanes and they seem to fall out of the sky a lot. Uh, you know, back in the uh, 1920s, and it's true that they did, uh, but there were a lot of improvements in the technology and a lot of improvements in the underwriting that went along the way. Uh, I do think that, um, uh, that that cyber is a line that is, that is here to stay, but uh, I, I think that uh, the, the degree to which we even can um, think that we understand where technology is headed 10 years down the road, for instance, where 10 years down the road, the dominant technology will likely be things like AI, for instance. Um, I, I don't think we are even scraping uh, the top of the iceberg here uh, when it terms, in terms of being able to understand those types of, of risks. And so to that extent, uh, you could argue that, that cyber is, is uh, is a line that's likely uh, to continue to persist and it's going to grow, um, but its growth could be thwarted in some sense by the very rapid um, evolution in terms of changing technologies that make it very difficult for us as an industry to get our arms around, around it. Because we don't, to the extent we might be rolling out AI technology, we don't have any loss history. Okay, we lay it here. As um, soon as we develop some sort of a loss history on ransomware attacks, it turns out ransomware attacks are now um, uh, diminishing in frequency. So we're on to the next thing. And so we have these kind of enormous technological leaps, which is very hard for us as an industry to get our arms around in, in a way that we get our arms around a property related risks or auto related risks. Okay, good. Uh a lot of questions come in from the audience. This one from Jessica DeFelice from Simpson McCready. How long do you estimate that this hard market will last, specifically maybe in California and Florida? Okay, uh, so how long will the hard market last? Uh, it's it's lasted about, so oh, about four years now, I would say. I'd say it's got another good two years in it. And, um, you know, with the exception of, say, workers' comp. And in, in somewhere like, uh, I think you had California and Florida, well, uh, you would expect those uh, those markets and maybe a couple of other hard hit markets like Texas uh, uh, to have additional staying power, obviously uh, in the in the property lines in in particular. But um, you've got again problems in the tort environment, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, that affects uh, quite a few lines as well. You know, GL product liability, uh, commercial autos being hit hard by that. So I'd say the hard market has some legs. Um, and I'd say uh, at least through 2024 and, and, and potentially beyond. Okay, good news. All right. Uh, coming in from Mark Bolton. Mark wants to know, uh, talking about the uh, unemployment rate and the, the hot job market, uh, what about the people who stopped working during the pandemic? How are people that don't, quote, don't want to work again living? 
where are they getting their income and when do you expect that to stop? It's, it's unsustainable. People who have stopped working the pandemic and they don't want to go back in the labor force. What do you think of that, Bob? Yeah, so um, there are very, they, there's still approximately uh, 1.2 trillion with a T in excess savings uh, out there in households. And what that means is this is the accumulated savings from uh, the inability to spend as well as uh, uh, COVID-related relief funds that are sitting in people's bank accounts, okay? So they are draining those. Uh, there were supplemental forms of relief as well that you're well aware of. Most of these have ended, but help people stay out for longer and preserve their savings, extended unemployment benefits and a variety of other things uh, that were out there also. Um, uh, but what some people simply have decided to do, and I, I, I can uh, almost hear the frustration or the, uh, or, you know, the, the inability to kind of comprehend, because I share this with you, how it is that people can kind of look at what's going on out there, complain about inflation, yet not step back into the, into the labor force. Right, right. And, and I, I think, it, you know, and not understanding that everything they consume has to be produced by someone else uh, out there, and, and they are contributing nothing to the gross domestic product of the, of the country. Um, unfortunately, what it seems to be and is, is that uh, quite a few people are willing to live um, in a way that will probably uh, provide for them a, a standard of living in their retirement less than, than they would have anticipated, but they're just not going to, they just can't see themselves going back uh, into, the, the, into the labor force. But uh, we also see, uh, unfortunately, you know, if we look at prime age workers around uh, the ages of 20 to 54, but we see them not returning to the labor force the way that uh, we would expect them to as well. Now, the best um, explanation I've heard for some of this is that some of these people are probably engaged in, and maybe significant numbers in kind of, uh, you know, under the table gig economy type work. Okay, so they're not being picked up by the official labor market, uh, 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 labor department statistics. I think there is probably something to that. Um, but uh, it's also the case that uh, this, uh, uh, people are looking at the value of their homes, which have appreciated rapidly in recent years. So they look at their net worth and they say, well, you know, my net worth is up as a result of my most valuable asset, my home. Uh, if I need to, I'll sell that. I'll trade down. I'll do something. So uh, despite the route in markets last year, people are feeling relatively comfortable about their household finances. And most people fantasize about retiring. I will tell you, Joan, I have a class that I teach uh, where we also uh, talk about personal financial management. And of course, I, I poll my 21-year-olds in the class at the beginning of every semester, when do you want to retire? Mind you, they're 21. The vast majority want to retire before the age of 60. Okay. Those are those are Gen Zs. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll see how that turns out for them. Yeah, we'll see. Couple couple more questions here, Bob, before we let you go. Lonald Robertson asks: uh, Is there enough claim history data to determine how the cost of electric vehicles is affecting the underwriting profit and loss for auto insurers? So let's talk about electric vehicles. What are you seeing, uh, if anything? Uh, yeah, so, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So the good news is in 2022, we had the highest proportion of auto sales uh, ever um, uh, were EVs uh, being sold. Uh, now, so it was about 10%. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of those were sold in China, in other countries, and a relatively small amount sold in the US. So the vast majority of EV sales are not in the United States, uh, okay. predominantly in Asia uh, and, and in Europe at the current point in time. Um, are we getting there in terms of ascertaining, uh, you know, loss history and appropriate rating for EV? Uh, I think we are, we are, we are getting there. Um, and, um, and I think on net, it's uh, likely to be favorable uh, in the sense that uh, EVs, uh, once they are fully, uh, we have a fully built out network of EVs and charging cases and so forth. Um, uh, from what I can see so far, there is a, 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 a small increment, in other words, um, a, a relatively small, uh, higher expected loss, um, and then therefore associated pure premium on electric vehicles relative to internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, we tend to conflate EVs with technology. What's really going to be the big driver here 
is are these uh, you know technologies you know level one two three four and five in terms of autonomous driving, uh, which will ultimately come along with uh, more advanced EVs. That's where we actually should expect to see uh, you know declining uh, claim frequency and although perhaps not driving down uh, claim severity. Now we could wind up in a situation certainly where we have declining claim frequency overall, severity continues to rise. Um, uh, but what we are going to do as a country is we are going to make vehicles safer and safer. The odds of dying in an automobile accident should hopefully fall. Um, although, again, there can still be some severe accidents out there. But right now, from what I can see, um, incrementally higher costs for insuring vehicles. Okay. Well, Bob, the hour has just flown by. It really has. Your, your wealth of information for all of us and uh, you the way you present it is just fantastic. We like the fast pace here for sure. So, Listen, thank you so much. Please, we'd love to have you back again because you're just in demand and I know you're a busy guy, but we appreciate what you're doing for the industry, specifically raising all our young folks uh, and educating them so well for, for us to, uh, to, to hire. So we appreciate you very much. My pleasure, anytime. So then I want to just chat about our next upcoming programs on January 25th, everyone. We're going to get some insights on a kickstart your healthy habits of eating, nutrition, exercise. Uh, we have terrific guest, Matt Reese, former White House speechwriter and Food and Health Facts newsletter founder, Kristen Kofeld, founder of The Culinary Cure. They are a terrific pair talking about the steps we just can take every single day and make it easy on ourselves to get healthier. Uh, then back to insurance on February the 1st, we're going to speak to the CEO of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and find out what's going on in the states with regulation there. And then we're back to the economy on February 15th. I'm going to hear from, we're here from my friend, uh, longtime friend, Dr. LaVon Henry, a former senior economist at the White House. Uh, Council of Economic Advisors to talk about the uh, the economic outlook again. So uh, please do fill out our surveys. We read every single comment. So you have an idea for a next topic for us, please put that in your survey results. So uh, thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, we're going to see you uh, next week. Bye. Bye.